So Wright used the cantilever extensively in a lot of his designs. Um, we'll talk about what the cantilever is, but he used the cantilever to unite indoor and outdoor spaces in at least one of his buildings that we'll be taking a look at called Falling Water. Um, a cantilever is basically when a beam or slab is extended a substantial distance beyond a supporting column or wall. And the overhanging portion is called the cantilever. And I'll show you that on this next slide that we look at. Um, before st like steel and concrete um, were invented, the use of the cantilever was not um, common because steel and concrete, they're so strong that they can extend past that column. Um, the beam can extend past the column a lot, whereas with traditional building materials such as wood or stone, the material just wasn't strong enough to make cantilevers. So it was a relatively new, um, I don't know, method using the cantilever. And Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright used that a lot, um, at least in this next design that we'll look at. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at that. Uh, yep, cantilevers. We'll take a look at the building that uses cantilevers. So these portions of concrete and steel, reinforced concrete, um, coming off of this building. So this is the supporting wall. Sometimes there might be like a column. That might even be a column right there. I'm not sure. But that portion of slab that's going past that is called a cantilever. And he used those a lot in this particular design, um, Falling Water. Um, the Edgar Kaufman residence at Bear Run, Pennsylvania. He built this in 1936. Um, <clears throat> so this is one of the most elegant designs that Wright produced, and it's a very famous piece of architecture. Um, it's called Falling Water a lot of the time. Um, you're probably going to hear it called Falling Water a lot more than the Edgar Kaufman residence. Um, but you can see the use of these horizontal cantilevers here. At least a couple of them. There's probably some over here too. You can't really see them because of these trees. Um, and they actually, he did, did that on purpose because he's trying to echo these rock ledges um, that are contained within this waterfall. So he's creating um, some harmony here with the natural environment. Um, <clears throat> so the steel frame that this is made with is sheathed in local stone. So you can see the stone here that's local. Um, which is also a device for blending this this piece of architecture into the natural environment, which is something that Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright is very famous for. Um, <clears throat> there are some vertical accents in the building as well. Um, some say the vertical accents in the building echo the forest around the building. So he's you know borrowing um, from the forest as well. And as you can see, the design of this house really blends in with the surrounding natural environment. And it doesn't intrude on the natural environment like some structures might. It echoes the natural forms and really becomes a part of the landscape. And that's what is so unique and interesting about this piece, uh, this piece of architecture. Um, so let's see. Frank Lloyd Wright is known for you know, building with it, an awareness of the surroundings. Um, he used a lot of open floor planning, which means he removed a lot of um, walls and opened up spaces, which is actually still popular today. Like my house, actually my living room and my kitchen are all one big room. And that's kind of a newer concept that Frank Lloyd Wright actually w was part of developing um, that concept because back in the day, um, there were walls separating almost every room in the house. Um, <clears throat> And he placed windows in corners to open up cor um, to open up the wind went to open up the rooms, um, and he used sliding glass doors, which were inspired by Japanese screens, but they also were a device to open up the house to the external environment through the use of windows and also just letting in that natural light. So, um, we'll move on to steel frame construction. Um, we'll take a look at the Seagram building. Um, we'll take a look at this really simple diagram of steel frame construction that is also in your book. And here's a building that uses steel frame construction. Um, this is called the Seagram building in New York. It was built in 1956 through 1958, and it uses the steel frame construction technique. And it was an office space. 
And as you can see, it has a lot of height. Um, and the base features an open public area where people can gather. Um, <clears throat> And there are a lot of vertical lines in the building, which emphasize the height of the building. Uh, so you, you know, and then there's also a grid system in place, but there's some lines here, especially on the corners of the building that you might follow up. Um, the lines from the windows, you might lead your eye all the way up. Um, <clears throat> and there's, like I said, there's pattern due to the arrangement and repetition of the windows. And it is capped at the top by this section here that's kind of heavy and decorative and it, it caps the design. It stops your eye from going up and it gives it a, a sense of completion at the top. Um, and the architect, the architect that built this um, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson, there's two guys that actually built this, but they thought less is more and that was their main motto. And that's the case for a lot of modern architecture and skyscraper buildings is that less is more with the design anyway, which is a kind of a break from the past. Traditional architecture is very decorative. So um, so the international style had a huge influence on world architecture, and some say it even had a negative effect. It often replaced these unique regional styles that, you know, a lot of the traditional architecture had. Um, and the international designs, style designs were standard, very simple, and by the 20th century, modern architecture was largely, largely done in the international style. Um, the structures are very uniform, they're glass covered, they're very grid-like, and it makes sense that this style is used to um, create skyscrapers, which are typically, you know, office buildings. They're not homes, <clears throat> they're not cozy, and they symbolize kind of the modern corporation um, pretty well because they lack that personal touch. Um, so it kind of makes sense that skyscrapers are um, used for urban, commercial, um, office spaces. So we'll talk about some recent innovations. Um, in the late 20th century, architectural forms continue to evolve. Um, so we got some more construction techniques and materials. Computers came into the pictures and they were able to analyze the strength and weaknesses of complex structures and that that helped to develop forms that had never been seen. Just having the computer technology helping us um, design. And so suspension structures, you know, they've been around for a long time. We, you know, we used them back in hunter-gatherer times when we created tents. And um, further on, we used them to create bridges. Um, but, you know, recently this building um, was built and it's a totally new and kind of a revolutionary way of building <clears throat> a large building here. So we'll take a, a look at this. This is the uh, Jepesen Terminal Building in Denver at the International Airport there. It was built in 1994 um, by the Fentress Bradburn Architects. And it's a giant tent-like structure composed of 15 acres, acres of woven fiberglass. Um, it's one of the largest suspension buildings in the world, and the white roofing material lets in a lot of natural light uh, without conducting heat, and it's coated with Teflon so that it's water resistant and that also makes it easier to clean. And the design is actually inspired by the snow-capped Rocky Mountains, which are close by. You can't see them in this photo, but they are off in the distance um, surrounding the, you know, airport in Denver here. Um, so art museums are a great place to exhibit um, cutting edge architecture and um, the Guggenheim, you know, a lot of you might have heard of this. It's a very famous structure and it's basically kind of like a, a piece of sculpture in itself and the architect actually called this a um, metallic flower. So we'll take a look at this. This is the Guggenheim um, Museum. It's in Spain, built in 1997. Um, this is Frank Gehry's um, design. And like I said, it's like a work of functional sculpture, basically. Um, computer graphics and modeling applications were used to create this design. Um, and the building seems to kind of dance. And the main feature is this glass enclosed um, atrium. <clears throat> and the billowing 
form of this building um, really completely conceals the structure that's actually holding it up. Um, and like it's it's really an interesting piece uh, covered in this, you know, basically um, metal so that it, it becomes very shiny. Um, <clears throat> so it's a really cool building. Um, Carbon fiber is the next material that we will talk about. It's basically the first technological innovation in architecture in the 21st century. And it's an expensive material even now. It was even more expensive when it was originally made, you know, when they originally started making this stuff, it was even more expensive than it is today. Um, <clears throat> but it, you know, we're thinking with time, it's gonna have even more of an impact on how we build the carbon, the fact that we can, we can build with carbon fiber now. Um, aircraft, uh, racing cars, and bicycle frames are often made from um, carbon fiber. And it, it's just a lightweight, really strong material. Um, and it, it allows for a lot of new architectural forms. Um, so we'll take a, a look at a, at a building that's actually made with carbon fiber um, by Atelier uh, Bow Wow. It's the BMW Guggenheim Lab from 2011 through 2012, um, Germany. It's basically an open air carbon fiber structure and it's used to house um, discussions, screenings, talks, different workshops. The building is very light and this is advantageous because it can be moved around and it's actually light enough to be moved around by one person. So all of the components for this building technically can be handled by one person um, because it's just so light. Um, it actually can be moved around. Um, not only, you know, the different pieces can be moved around inside of it to customize it for what you might need it for that day, but it's also been to three different continents. And, um, so it's, it's kind of a, an interesting idea and application of carbon fiber in architecture. That's, um, really only possible due to the material of carbon fiber. Um, so we'll talk about cross laminated timber or CLT and it uses wood, which is a traditional material, but it's using it in a new way. And it's made by um, laminating slabs of wood with their grains at an angle to each other. And this makes it as strong as concrete, but much lighter and more flexible. So it has a lot of advantages. It's also heat resistant and, or I should say fire resistant and uh, resistant to earthquakes as well because it has that flexibility built in. Um, and if the trees are harvested from sustainable forests, it's actually considered a carbon neutral building material. So it has quite a few um, advantages. So we'll take a look at a building in Portland, Oregon. Um, the radiator building, and it was built by Path Architecture in 2015. And it's made with cross laminated timber that was sustainably harvested from a nearby forest. And you can see there's a lot of vertical lines um, from the top to the bottom of this building, um, which once again, they're emphasizing verticality in this, in this large building. Um, over the window, there are actually these angled slats that can be adjusted and programmed um, to let in just the right amount of natural light, depending on the time of day. And the building is a lot safer in an earthquake than a steel framed building and is made of, you know, like I said, cross laminated timber, um, very flexible, strong. And also the building features sensors that are 12 feet underground. And if they sense an earthquake, they automatically shut the gas off to the building. They, and they also alert all of the workers in the building via text message that there is an earthquake. Um, and even the elevators automatically go to the ground floor during an earthquake. So that's kind of interesting and, and cool and definitely a new thing in architecture. Um, so we will pick up with the building green section in the next video.